Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, we have a very interesting topic for discussion today. And the topic is, as you know, India's large gig economy that assumes, of course, that India already has a large gig economy. And we're going to talk about whether that is indeed the case or whether, uh, you know, you know uh, there's scope for more growth and things like that. Uh, so to introduce myself, I'm Vijay Sambamurthy. I am the founder and managing partner of Lexogen, uh, a corporate law firm headquartered in India with offices in Singapore. I am a transactional lawyer with about uh, 24 plus years of experience. And my primary areas of focus are private equity, venture capital, M&A uh, uh, transactions. And I do a lot of transactional work, particularly in the technology and digital space. So um, the gig economy is something that I help grow on a daily basis. So this is a topic which is uh, close to my heart as well. So it gives me a lot of pleasure to be here today in front of you. The topic we're going to be talking about uh, is an interesting one because um, it's a you know sort of a reorientation or a redefinition of something that has existed um, in in our human history for quite a while. Uh, this whole gig economy thing, but the term gig economy has been a more uh, recent uh, millennial sort of a term, if you will. Uh, but uh, essentially, what it means is that it talks about a system in which there is a more flexible and agile way of functioning where people, uh, the individual people who are constituents in the economy, have more of a choice and they are seen as being more in control. And it's, it's uh, generally perceived as a more progressive and, uh, you know, sensible and a constructive way for uh, individuals and organizations to engage with each other in the content of business. So obviously the term gig for uh, those of you who are music lovers, uh, uh, you must be, uh, you know, I'm sure aware that the term gig refers to a concert or, you know, getting a job to perform in front of a crowd. Um, and, and that's why I was quite happy when we all landed this gig to speak at this <laughs> event on this topic, right? And the reason it has caught on and become such a fanciful term now is you know, we, have to the, we have to thank the millennials for it. Um, I would love to call myself one, but I know that I'm not. Uh, but I think uh, the term has become more popular uh, with the advent of the <clears throat> digital technologies and the digital economy globally. And it started getting noticed and started getting talked about a much more in the digital era in recent times. And it has been progressively growing uh, in size, but really in the last few years, it has galloped ahead, um, you know, much in consonance with how the digital economy has. And I'm told that uh, today, globally, the size of the gig economy is, uh, you know, estimated at about 350 billion US dollars globally and growing. So that's a pretty impressive number for, for something uh, to you know get recognized in a structured format. And as a leading economy of the world, India is not, uh, you know, we can't expect India to be far behind in this. And India too has, as I'm sure all of you are aware, and many of the Indians in the audience here will know that the gig economy has become a very integral, uh, you know, part of our lives, of our everyday lives, and all of us are, you know, uh, users and contributors to this economy and also beneficiaries of this economy. And it is um, very interesting for me to note that, you know, the recent economic survey that was tabled before the Indian Parliament, the 2020-21 economic survey, actually recognizes the growing importance of the Indian gig economy. And the report talks about how the whole startup culture, which has really caught on over the past decade in India, as we all know, uh, and, you know, the millennial mindset of looking at life 
and the emergence of a huge amount of uh, venture backed uh, an indian millennial funded or uh, sorry millennial uh, fueled uh, drive towards um, you know um, internet and aggregation companies like zomato swi urban clap and so on these company you know the growth of these companies has really given a fillip to the gig economy because they essentially thrive on the principles of the gig economy so ladies and gentlemen we are here to talk about this a uh, uh, very interesting topic today and i would like to introduce uh, to you my panel i would have liked to um, i would have liked to uh, also start by introducing our first guest who is not here today yet i'm hoping he can join uh, you know mr jay shranjan was supposed to be with us um uh, mr I'll, uh, i'll introduce him as and when he joins hopefully but uh, i'm sure all of you know him he is the principal secretary uh, to the government of um, telangana and he heads uh, you know two departments there uh, industries and commerce and information technology he is a fairly a accomplished and uh, you know uh, well known bureaucrat not just in the state of telangana but across india and maybe in certain parts of the world as well he has had a very long illustrious career and uh, has held key positions in the government and has led government initiatives relating to industry energy tribal development social development and poverty alleviation and mr ranjan has won numerous awards and recognitions including interestingly the uh, royal order of the polar star by his uh, majesty the king of sweden for promoting uh, swedish business interests in india i'm told he had a big role to play in ikea's uh, you know setting up operations in hyderabad then <clears throat> he's also been an active supporter and uh, you know participant in several social impact and charitable causes uh, for a wide range of causes like child rights uh, inclusive healthcare cultural promotion and so on next i would like to introduce in our panel <coughs> excuse me stacy enworthy stacy is the founder and chairman of asylum capital a us based company i think he's based in atlanta in the us and uh, stacy is uh, focused on sponsoring research and development of commercializable technologies and intellectual property and their key areas of focus include ai ml uh, neuro rehabilitation robotics and so on stacy is a 25 year old veteran in the areas of finance and technology and over the course of his career he has had several leadership positions in reputable technology companies and he's you know had dabbled in investment banking finance risk management and so on and he's a regular speaker at uh, technology events uh, worldwide so welcome to the panel stacy the third panelist we have here today who i'd like to end, uh, welcome is ankam kumba he is the chairman of africa development and futures group and is a leading expert on the african market he is based in michigan in the us but has a very very strong focus on the african continent and the opportunities that it offers he's been a lecturer at the university of michigan and uh, he's been there for more than a decade and he is a member of uh, you know university of michigan's uh, stem africa initiative he has been an avid ambassador of international scientific capacity and human development and has advised and work closely with uh, numerous regional and multi national agencies including the african union and also he's been an advisor to several african governments so uh, welcome as well to the panel and come it's a pleasure to have you here thank you very much thank you very much yeah. okay great so uh, you know mr ranjan is still not here so you know i'm going to start by posing a generic question uh to the two of you so the way i'm going to structure this discussion is that i'm going to pose this question to the two of you 
uh, and hopefully to the three of you, if Mr. Ranjit is able to join. But I'm going to pose one generic question, invite responses from the two of you. And uh, after that, I'm also going to uh, pose one specific question to each of you based on your respective uh, experiences. And after that, I would like to, uh, if we have time, open the floor for questions from the audience. I hope we have time. And therefore, I will request you to keep your responses to about five minutes each to each question. So that will give us some time to, you know, give the audience some questions as well. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> the, so here's my generic question. And I'm going to throw that uh, at Stacy first. So um, we've talked about the gig economy, and I gave you this number, which uh, you know talks about a potential 350 billion size today of this economy globally. How large and meaningful is it really? And you know, are we today just staring at the tip of the iceberg, or are we uh, are we pretty much done with this whole gig economy thing? Is it like a passing fad which will pass? And more specifically, do you see it, uh, you know, growing in size and importance even in a post-pandemic era? Because the reason I ask this is a lot of the gig economy companies have seen like a transformational growth in size and the economy as a whole has grown in the last two years, primarily because of the constraints imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. So what happens in a a scenario post pandemic do you still see the gig economy growing at such a, a crazy pace and and specifically uh, you know i know it's not fair to put you on the mat about uh, india where we can see some disruption but i can if mr ranjan is not able to join us th this piece about what sectors in india we can see major disruption and i can contribute uh, and i you know i can share my role as the chair and chip in as a speaker for that bit uh, but, you know, uh, obviously, you guys are the experts, and I would love to hear uh, from you. Sure. Well, I, I'm going to take the last part first. Uh, because, because of the, I think because of COVID, yes, I think the gig economy uh, has sort of reached a critical mass, an escape of velocity, uh, where a lot of people became consumers of services from the gig economy, grocery delivery, um, things that they might not have tried, might, might not have consumed before the pandemic. I think a lot of people uh, got used to working from home. Uh, they got used to working on platforms that are now available in terms of, of mobile devices and their, their desktops, which really enable sort of the, the gig economy, this kind of friction-free communication between the deliverers of the service and the requesters of the service, uh, kind of the friction-free search for resources and the ability if someone wants to provide a service, to provide that service without having to search for customers. You can each lo log on to a platform, uh, be it a broad platform, or maybe it's a very niche platform. There's platforms for everything from dog walking to, you, if you can imagine it, there's a platform. And I think that, that the pandemic probably uh, accelerated the acceptance of this uh, uh, in terms of consumption by, by many years. But I think it also, the fact that people are now able to work from home people who wouldn't necessarily have been used to being a gig worker, if you will. Um, now that they're home and they have access to a platform, they're used to being able to deliver services digitally. Um, you know, they may be in a profession, maybe a copywriting, advertising, legal might be an example with your, in your business where they may be able to provide services uh, on a kind, kind of a piecemeal basis to multiple consumers in a more standardized fashion um, and they may want to take advantage of the fact that they can not have to commute as much. So I think the pandemic has really accelerated. I think we're going to see the, this whole gig economy continue uh, to, to blossom uh, all around the world. I think you'll see it start to reach into uh, areas that it hasn't been. Uh, here in the more developed uh, economies where you have uh, more developed payment mechanisms, if you will, you'll see things like the creative arts, uh, songwriting, you know, performance arts, uh, uh, you know, the uh, people, you know, doing small videos. I mean, thing where where they're doing entertainment almost on a per payment basis and getting paid micro payments, not by everybody, but by people who you know to want to pay. So almost the 
the original concept of gigging if you were like down at the train station and people will contribute. So now that these platforms are available and they're becoming pervasive, I think as telecommunications platforms continue to penetrate around the world uh, that create this mechanism for uh, exchange, I think you're going to see this continue. And I think it's only become a, a greater and greater, bigger, bigger phenomenon. Thank you for that, Stacey. Very, very insightful. And uh, I agree with you that, you know, it's getting deeper and deeper, but we can talk about that a little more. But first, uh, I would like to also get, uh, you know, Income's uh, inputs on this. Yeah, thank you very much again for, for, that, uh, for that question. I agree with Stacey uh, uh, pretty much. Uh, the gig economy is here to stay. I think uh, it's going to only grow. Uh, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not an idol. It's not even a new thing at all. It's only taking more significance because of the platform that have come up to make the world a smaller village, make people closer to each other, make people able to sell their services more easily, more instantly, make people able to find out services, those who need the services, create a better marketplace. And so it's taking on a, a, a much more vibrant um, um, uh, look, uh, if, if I would say. But you know, as long as in nations like India, like Africa, and here in the U.S., the former sector, the career path that gives people middle classes doesn't exhaust the whole employability, the whole marketplace. Everyone else is out there looking for something to do to end a dollar, whatever it is in their professions. You even have some people with careers already. I mean, professors, after work, they can drive an Uber for a few uh, extra bucks. I mean, that's uh, just quickly get something on, on, on a contract. Yeah, and this, these other professors is just about every career you can imagine, nurses, doctors. The extra dollar, the fact that you have skills beyond your career path, your nine to five job that limits you. You have time at, on the weekend or in the evening to spend. You're a young person hustling for a little more, a few more dollars. The, the, the platforms provide opportunity for anyone to sell the least talent that they have for whatever dollar they can get. And for anybody who has, who needs any kind of service to very easily find it and for the financial transactions to be as fluid as you could imagine, you know, so it, it simply makes this, uh, this, uh, gig economy, I think for me, um, as I said, something that is, uh, is going to grow in, especially in, in, in uh, developing countries. The informal sector is very large. I mean, in the Western countries, they are more industrialized. So you have, you have the industrial trajectories. But you go to India, you go to Africa, South America, Asia, the, the public sector, the ministries, the bureaucracies, they still dominate the economy in terms of uh, empl employment. And uh, you still have the issue where university graduates don't uh, lack some skills to be, uh, to, to be uh, absorbed into the system. Sometimes you say it's lack of skills, but sometimes the system is, is constrained, it's so small. The industry, the big companies, the industrial revolution didn't happen in, in the developing country, it happened in the West. The, the developing world hasn't gone through the industrial revolution to provide what um, Ronald Reagan and the, the U.S. are called small government, big economy that absorbs people. So you see how in, in, in the developing world, small economy, big governments. Now, but there are people there who are, who are not part of the government. How do they survive? They are mostly people in the marketplace doing small petty jobs here, moving from the rural areas to the urban areas, even agriculture. How do they interact and get their small skills or their small scale farming, their small scale activities, have uh, access to a, a global marketplace? It's a gig economy. The fact that technology has provided a platform for them to be able to uh, have access to the global market, it just makes, I think, in my mind, as long as government, political leadership, is not able to industrialize the whole country, then the gig economy, I think, it will only grow because it will fill that vacuum. Thanks very much for that, income. Very, very fascinating insights. And uh, it's just reinforcing uh, the point that uh, Stacey was making as well, that the progression is real and it's here to stay. And uh, we have just been uh, joined by Mr. Ranjan. Uh, welcome to the panel, Mr. Ranjan. Um, are you able to hear me? Are you able to hear me? Thank you. My yes. Okay, wonderful. I, I took the liberty of uh, introducing you uh, you know, even before you joined, uh, um, uh, and uh, even if I say so myself, I think I may have, uh, uh, you know, done a pretty okay job of it. <laughs> uh, 
So um, I will straight away post the question to you because um, we were just talking about the first, uh, uh, you know, question which I posed to all three of you, and I will just, you know, for uh, you know, everyone's benefit, repeat a, a crunched version of the question, right? So I'm basically the question: what we are talking about, where you know, Stacy and Ankam have just paid in, is that, you know, w- what is the true relevance and size of the gig economy uh, globally? And also specifically in India, and uh, are we really looking at the tip of the iceberg right now, or uh, or is it like a fad that is going to fade away? And uh, specifically, uh, what I would love to get your inputs on is, uh, you know, what are the sectors in India? Because these, uh, these this is a question which uh, Stacy and Income haven't uh, covered, understandably, as they are not from the market. But I would love to get your perspective, Mr. Ranjan, on. What are the sectors in India where we can see major disruption due to the gig economy or where we are already seeing so? Okay, I think we may have lost Mr. Ranjan. (laughs) I think I'll repeat the question when he comes back, but uh, let us continue with the conversation. Um, I'm going to, you know, throw my next question for Stacy, and uh, it could, you know, Stacy be a bit of a, a controversial or, a, you know, provocative question from your perspective. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I know that you do a lot of great work in, you know, sponsoring uh, research and development projects to develop uh, patentable and monetizable technology. I would like your views. I'd like to understand how you view the whole gig economy thing. Is it like a threat, existential threat to what you do and what you stand for? Uh, is it likely to create what I call a Napster-like mindset that is essentially antithetical to the very notions of intellectual property? I'm very curious to get your uh, views on this. Uh, so the answer is no, I don't see it as a threat at all. Um, and that's because, uh, you know, I think there is, it, it, I think the gig economy is a threat to certain industries, uh, certainly those that, that provided the value add of sort of organizing uh, labor into, into a cohesive, easily accessible pool and providing uh, a search capability for people who could deliver a service or a ranking capability. I mean, those, those functions in the economy of being able to match uh, consumers with a service provider have been historically provided by other entities, other marketplaces, if you will. In the gig economy, essentially, you now have a marketplace where those and the consumer. Just of course, now it seems like it. <laughs> Mr. Ranjan, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So, I was just saying that today is not a very good day to promote this show. No, so, we can have... A... No, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, first of all, my apology. It has been uh, raining very, very heavily in Hyderabad. So no problem. Uh, the power uh, connection the is extremely unreliable, and my apologies in that. Did you hear any of that? I'll try to remain uh, as, as much as possible. So, uh, the gig economy in India definitely has become extremely, and uh, during the pandemic, after the pandemic, I mean, of course. I, mm-hmm. I can't say after the pandemic. But now, as the pandemic is tailing out, this economy is even more significant. And uh, 
at one point in time, we were under the impression and that was the visible uh, evidence that the gig economy is really towards the bottom of the pyramid i mean those kind of uh, low paying uh, low end kind of jobs where uh, individual skill sets don't matter a can be easily replaced by b can be easily be we were run let us say uh, cab drivers food delivery guys e-commerce delivery guys and so on and so forth but we have now started realizing that the gig economy works ex- equally efficiently at very high ends also some of the top most scientists some of the top most uh, economists chartered accountants we have seen that uh, they are not any more related to a particular company or a particular organization they are freelancing uh, as much as they can and uh, many organizations also are preferring to take such people because uh, in those cases the skills is also uh, updated so uh, i don't have uh, an estimate of numbers but definitely it is a phenomenon that is growing uh, many fold and uh, more we will be i mean we won't be surprised if we find a huge significant number of uh, the employable population of our country engaged in uh, the gig economy but i would like to re- reflect on some of the points which other analysts mentioned which is about the social protection see uh, while there is some agility in uh, engaging gig workers and uh, you can find people precisely meeting your requirements at the right point in time but if you look at while as i said at the beginning they are able to turn this to their advantage they are able to make the opportunity make best use of the opportunities really find that particular organization or institution which really uh, cares for the kind of talent they bring it on the table but as, as i said at the bottom end of the pyramid where the largest number of gig workers which protections etc marring the landscape so uh, i for one uh, i work for the provincial government of telangana in uh, india and uh, i uh, as a part of my responsibilities i also look after e-commerce and uh, i uh, i have umpteen uh, episodes almost uh, more than a dozen episodes in the last few years when i have received uh, issues and complaints and grievances from gig workers and uh, sometimes the complaint is fairly organized in the sense that uh, i mean hundreds of them come and uh, protest or uh, raise issues which feel that the employer has not had properly and most of the times it is to do something with the with the basic uh, rights and basic entitlements of these or the needs of the employers being more uh, flexible and agile kind of systems needs to be tempered with uh, very strong rules of social protection and who creates that uh, layers of social protection who implements it who monitors it i hope we'll get some to discuss and speak about those things also but we'll rest with these opening remarks with you wonderful that was that was very insightful and uh, uh, very useful to us as well coming from your experience uh, in government thank you for that mr ranjan but i'm going to come back to you on this point you make about you know the complaints that you're getting from gig workers and stuff like that because i do have a question on which uh, i'm very curious to get your inputs we will dive into that when i throw this uh, second round of uh, specific questions at you all uh, but thank you very much for uh, your views um, all three of you on the generic question which post which i think uh, is very uh, critical to this uh, topic and i'm sure everybody found your inputs very very fascinating yeah now i'm going to dive into the question that uh, i already asked stacy but i'm going to for the sake of flow uh, you know repeat a crunched version is the gig economy by definition antithetical to the notion of intellectual property which uh, you know which you represent stacy because you uh, do so much of great work in uh, you know funding and sponsoring development of ip for monetizable technologies so uh, does the gig economy help you or hinder you how do you see it so uh, it actually helps us 
Uh, I think it is a threat to certain industries, but it, it's not a threat to us. We actually see opportunities. Um, essentially, anytime you can create a platform, which these gig, you know, the platforms for the gig economies are really where the intellectual property opportunities are. And the reason is, is that you create tremendous amounts of data. You create tremendous amounts of data on the on the on the service providers, and you also create tremendous amounts of data on the consumers. And they volunteer this data as part of their participation on the platform. So uh, you can uh, the intellectual property opportunity is in what you do with that data. Uh, just like I, I was saying a little bit earlier, but with something with an industry, you know, something like TikTok. Uh, you have people who create content. That's kind of a gig economy, particularly if they're getting paid for it. You have people that consume content. Um, but the magic of TikTok and platforms like that uh, are the algorithms uh, that sort of crunch through the preferences the, uh, the and determine what, how to optimize that platform for both the providers and the consumers. So though that intellectual property opportunity is sort of inherent in any platform where you have kind of this matching function and where you're creating all this shared data function. So uh, I think as opposed to the more traditional marketplaces where any IP was sort of locked into a, you know, that central marketplace or the, the dominant provider, I think the gig economy creates uh, this, you know, this, this wealth of data that can be leveraged not only on that platform, but across platforms and for multiple purposes. And so I think it may, if anything, I, I think it may expand the intellectual property opportunities at the platform level. I, I don't think it necessarily creates many intellectual property opportunities for the participants in the platform. But if you're, if you're working with the plat at the platform level, I think that there's very good opportunities there. Thanks very much for that, Stacey. Um, you and I need to have an offline debate about this because uh, you know, this, this is a topic on which I can speak for hours, right? Literally. Uh, but, but given that we have a time limit here, but, uh, you know, thank you very much for that. And uh, now I'm going to pose this question to Ankam. You have a lot of, uh, experience. You're like an authority on Africa, right? So, uh, to me, you know, I, Africa is what I would call the next most relevant billion. Right. In terms of opportunity, in terms of uh, you know growth, in terms of where they are today and where they can be in the next ten, uh, in the next decade, I think it probably truly belo belongs to Africa. So my question is: Do you see a gig economy uh, taking shape in Africa? And more specifically, how can Indian startups tap into this opportunity and grow? Uh, you know, focusing on the African market. So, uh, Inkam, this question is for you. So certainly, uh, you know, I think the gig economy would even be stronger in Africa in the near future than the than the formal economy, than the uh, career path and industrial sectors. Uh, in terms of industrial development, Africa is uh, the least developed of all uh, regions of the world. It means uh, the, the majority of the population is not in the formal sector. Uh, so the challenge with Africa is that it's not one country. It's it's, uh, it's not one. It's one continent, but many countries with different uh, legal systems, reg regulatory environments that sometimes are not very aligned. The continent itself uh, has recognized this, and they are, they have recently created what they call the free trade area for the whole continent. So imagine Africa now has many countries, but one big continent um, uh, trade area, more like the Europe. Uh, many countries, but the eurozone is one economy. Imagine that. That's a, that's a three trillion dollar economy. So they are working to harmonize their policies and regulations. And when they do that, mobility of labor, mobility of uh, skills will, will be much more easier and, and of funds, you know, integrated economy. Now, just imagine that and how with uh, more, with, with uh, combining that with, with a strong public sector, how the vast uh, majority of the projected demographic growth that are on the continent, I'm sure my, my colleagues know about the demographic conversations. Africa is supposed to be the continent of the future in terms of share numbers. In, in the next one generation, 40% of all young folks in the world will be African. 40% of everybody combined China, India, Europe, America, everybody, 60%. That's a big, uh, you know, uh, uh, demographic here. The, the, the movement towards industrializing and creating the big firms to absorb these people is it's not as strong as the population growth itself. So the gig economy is just bound to grow substantively 
on the continent. You couple that with the fact that, say, the next 10 to 15 years, nine of the largest cities in the world will be in Africa. Imagine um, um, uh, Lagos, um, Addis Ababa, um, uh, Kinshasa. Those are, those are cities that will be in the $40, $50 million populations without the level, without the upskills and the uh, trained human capacity to develop industries. The big factor there is industrial development is weak. And so all these folks will be trying to earn a living. How to earn a living? Mostly as geek freelancers. And so the opportunity is substantive. As for India, I think uh, the market is for India to lose. Uh, Africa has, of course, uh, a legacy history with Europe. It has a relationship with, with, with the U.S. But I was just talking to, to you earlier. From the 60s, the, the non-aligned movement brought Africa and, 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 uh, and, and India closer, at least uh, politically and um, uh, conceptually. I mean, Africa, the material conditions in Africa mimic India more than any other developed world. That are, that are their partners. Uh, they are on the same temperate zone. The livelihoods, the challenges of the day-to-day -day life, they are very similar more than anybody else. So solutions made in India are much more easy to adapt in Africa than anyone else. I'll give you a quick example. I'm, I'm a little bit on, on the side. Look like high tech. You know, they, they, they've been policy on the continent to buy or import high tech from, say, China, from Europe, you know, from the developed world. But when it goes to Africa, it's not very functional. The material environment is not fitted for high tech. So they turn around and go buy lower tech from India because it's more fitted to the environment. It's, 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 there's a very similar concept here where um, when I was growing up and I, and I got the continent, often, Indians are very active in the commercial sector, in the, um, uh, you know, in, in the supermarkets, you know, in, the, in, in, in the retail industry. They've moved and they do very well in Africa. But on the high tech, they've been looking more to uh, Silicon Valley as outsourcing for more for higher um, uh, income on, on their level. But Africa is the market that I think India should look at for the future. Higher education to develop, to provide skills and the kind of platform we're talking about. What makes the gig now an issue is the platform that enables it. I think India is well positioned to help African countries develop their own platforms. Right now, there's a huge vacuum. Um, uh, China feels a little bit with this technology. Huawei is there. Europe and, uh, and uh, America are much more high tech. But India, the technology developed in India is by far more suited for Africa than any other. And I think if, if the Indian government, for example, which has this platform, or even under the Modi government, of doing India-Africa, there's, there's an India-Africa partnership on the table that is worth about four or five billion dollars of exchange. If on that kind of platform, a vision of letting, um, 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 uh, um, uh, enabling Indian universities that train skills, that provide these apps and platforms, partner with an African uh, 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 collaborators as one big free African market, I think India would have a lot more to, to, uh, to gain than anybody else. No, absolutely fascinating points you make there, and Kevin, I am in complete agreement with you. Uh, in, in India, we have this term called Jugad, which basically translates to hustle. And uh, it's a controversial word because all of us are very proud of our Jugad. Uh, but there are some of us who say that it holds us back from doing the, uh, you know, uh, higher segment work. But be that as it may, I think, uh, you know, the gig economy, uh, the, the essential part of uh, success of the gig economy, I think, is Jugad. And the reason I mentioned this is that it's very similar in Africa as well. Uh, and I think Indians and Africans have this uh, trait in common to hustle and, you know, stretch the dollar or stretch the whatever currency you're in to be and whatever else, right? And the other point I would make is uh, we have on this panel – uh, Mr. Ranjan, and he is from the government of one of the more uh, progressive states in India, which is Telangana. And this partnership that you're talking about between India, Indian and African companies, I think, uh, you know, I would definitely think that uh, Mr. Ranjan should take it up with his government to, uh, you know, see how more of the companies from there can look at Africa, because I agree with you that the opportunities are huge. Now, I'm going to quickly jump to ask uh, Mr. Rajan, a question that has been bothering me personally about the gig economy. Um, now, what happens is that, um, you know, when something like the gig economy takes shape, 
uh, everybody is excited about its potential and everybody is talking about how great it's going to be. But it also comes with a share of concerns. There are some concerns that have been raised, which Mr. Ranjan has already alluded to in his opening remarks. And uh, the concerns center around how, uh, you know, government uh, should or should not stand, right? For example, some governments may feel the need to step in to protect from a labor law standpoint. Uh, some governments may actually go beyond that and start getting into other areas of, uh, uh, you know, regulation. The broader question I wanted to pose to Mr. Ranjan, uh, you know, as somebody who's spent a long time in government is how do you, uh, how do you, uh, you know, conduct this balancing act or how do you see this playing out? Because the very DNA of a gig economy is the flexibility to operate as people deem fit. It's more free market than free market, conventionally as we understand it. Whereas uh, governments tend to get concerned about anything that is too free. So I'd love, love to get your inputs on that as well. So <clears throat> thank you, Vijay, for uh, asking that question. But uh, the honest answer is that we haven't really figured out that balance. If uh, it's that easy, then we would have seen a balanced uh, approach to regulation and opportunities everywhere in every sector of the economy. So we are still on a learning curve, but uh, whatever it may be, I have figured out uh, that there are three, four uh, basic principles. If those basic principles are uh, adopted, then by and large, allow the agility and flexibility to the employers, which we speak about. And also, you will have a measure of social protection, which is important from the workers' uh, point of view. So, a couple principles, three principles to be precise. One is that uh, instead of a government trying to micromanage the sector, what seems to work best is uh, some kind of a self-regulation, like the industry bodies coming together and uh, and creating some kind of a self-regulatory uh, mechanism. That works much more uh, effectively. The credibility of that system is much more than the government trying to mic micromanage everything because the intentions of the governments are not very clear what exactly are you trying to do. The second uh, good principle to follow is that uh, when we look at the gig economy in uh, totality, we should also realize that uh, there are lots of pluses which have happened. I mean, the sector per se, per se has benefited, but it has also created a very positive uh, multiplier effect. So let us say earlier you were uh, the annual income of a particular company before the gig economy was, let us say, 100 rupees. And because you have shifted to a gig model of employing your workers, the income has gone up to, let us say, 1,000 rupees or 500 rupees. So whatever has been incrementally uh, accruing to you, to ensure that a part of it actually is uh, sent back in a very transparent way to the workers. So the idea is that if uh, we are trying to capture the value at the bottom of the pyramid, if there's a belief that uh, the gig worker actually is a stakeholder or is a partner in whatever benefits the company is reaping, that as much as lots of their they are willing to work an extra hour or do something beyond their call of duty. If that sense of uh, belonging and that sense of participation and a sense of uh, equal stakeholder that is that is drilled out, that is kind of uh, then uh, another very important thing is that uh, whatever rules are uh, followed or uh, workers uh, benefit. If they are framed in a very objective and transparent manner, if there is clarity at the time of my joining itself, I have clarity on what I can demand, what I am entitled to, and what is beyond beyond my uh, kind of uh, terms. So, a lot of times I have noticed, I mentioned earlier that many times people protested, they have reached out to me, they have used my offices, all the answers. And uh, most of the time I realized that it's a lack of awareness rather than not having a adequate uh, clause or a term or a condition in their contract which causes this kind of uh, misunderstanding and uh, miscommunication. So these are some of the principles. If uh, these are adopted well, I, I guess uh, we'll be able to take care. But from a company's point of view also, I should add a couple of caveats. See, the companies, as I said, uh, will, will work the best. We have seen uh, any result in any of sector, be it uh, uh, e-commerce or food delivery or uh, cab uh, aggregators or 
many other sectors also. We have not really seen that the general effort because because of, of the level of competition amongst the players in that sector very very high. So only when they kind of uh, go through that phase of competing in a in a very cutthroat way, only then will they perhaps start uh, start realizing the virtue of collaborating. So. This is something which is not happening. But another thing, from a to be fair to the employers also, they are very concerned about uh, compliances. If they feel that if I add uh, this condition, that condition, this law, that regulation, the compliance burden will be so heavy that uh, it will take away lots of resources, lots of manpower, lots of their bandwidth. So whatever uh, regulation we frame, whether it is self-regulated or regulated by a third party. The compliance burden should be the the least, uh, so to say. So, as I said, there is no perfect balance that has been achieved. But the principles are emerging and evolving. And uh, I guess uh, if we can codify these and uh, make these a part of the work contract of the employer and the gig worker, I guess uh, things should become a uh, start. Thank you, coming. thank you for that very balanced and fair perspective, uh, Mr. Ranjan. I agree with you that companies uh, need to take responsibility as well. And uh, you know, at the same time, I also agree that the government shouldn't micromanage, because I think half the uh, problems that we face are when uh, either when uh, you know governments micromanage these things, uh, and you know it gets very difficult to operate something which is uh, based on flexibility. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, you know, companies too shouldn't take advantage of it, and you know, resolve. Uh, you know, resort to exploitative practices. I think it's a fine balance. Uh, I know which you must be dealing with day in and day out in uh, resolving such uh, kind of scenarios. And um, I, I, well, I'm surprised that we haven't been bumped off at the. Uh, so I'm guessing that some time has been added. So um, I, I'm just going to ask if there are any questions from the audience. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, throw one more question uh, to the panel very quickly. But are there any questions from the audience? I haven't seen any in the chat box. Uh, so I'm going to uh, pose a question. One more question is, you know, what are some of the sectors? You know, if each of you had to pick three sectors where you think the gig economy is going to majorly disrupt, what would those be? So I'm going to go with uh, Stacy first. You're on mute, Stacy. Sorry about that. So, uh, I, you know, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to pick the sectors that are already succeeding because they, they, you know, they're already doing well. So you gave me the easy question, I guess. I think home delivery uh, of anything, uh, uh, essentially, uh, in terms of goods. I think um, delivery of services, things that people used to do for themselves, uh, not just of you know purchasing things online, but actually you know services in kind of a in a very granular. Um, you know, very small, um, you know, uh, uh, service elements, if you will. And then I think the interesting one that's going to be, to, I think, to watch will be uh, gig economies in the more knowledge-based industries, uh, whether things will be able to become standardized enough uh, for certain things, you know, uh, accounting or, or uh, pick, pick, pick a service that typically is hasn't been standardized enough where you could have, you could essentially rotate uh, you know, uh, opportunities amongst providers, uh, I think you're going to see more and more of that. Thanks, Stacey. And Ken, what about you? Yeah, I share, I share very similar. I think, uh, quote unquote, in broad terms, the knowledge economy, knowledge systems, mm -hmm. because the, the skill sets there, uh, you know, are uh, 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 changing so fast. And offering lots of opportunity for other sectors, other other, other industries that are those who are in that, in that sector in, in in the knowledge economy, quote unquote, producers of knowledge, enablers of knowledge. I think uh, that's the the uh, the the biggest, the, the fastest growing area that I can imagine, especially from a, from a, an African perspective. Higher education, for example, over there, you know, yeah. things are going to transform. So you know. So, uh, uh, questions about you, about uh, education for certification of our skills. How do you transition from legacy systems as established towards these skills uh, required industries? So uh, knowledge systems, I think, will, will be the really driving force. There are sectors in terms of volume and uh, dollar capacity, uh, uh, 
dollar volume. Great. Thank you, Inka. Mr. Ranjan, what do you think? Uh, my answer is very similar I also agree that uh, uh, sectors where uh, there's lots of creativity, there's lots of innovation. Uh, these are the sectors which will now see the next wave of uh, gig economy. In fact, I have a very interesting personal experience to share. It just, uh, it's a nice coincidence. It happened just uh, two, three days ago. I was reviewing a proposal uh, received from a from an institution which wants to set up a fashion institute in Hyderabad. And uh, when I was reviewing the proposal, they have mentioned something very interesting. They have mentioned that students will be free to select the professors whom they want to whom they want to be taught by. So I can book slots. There'll be let us say for a particular subject, there are six professors, and I can book slot whether I'll go to his class or that person's class. Of course, this is all online teaching. So. So, very good example of how uh, knowledge-based uh, knowledge uh, system will be impacted by the economy for sure. Definitely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Ranjan. Uh, I will add in by saying uh, even the sector I'm in, which is professional services, uh, broadly speaking, and even more specifically, I will uh, say this controversially, is even my legal profession. I think is going to be majorly disrupted by the gig economy. Everybody's talking about how our profession will be disrupted by AI ML. Uh, I think it is more, uh, you know, uh, likely to be disrupted by the gig economy, I think, and disrupted in a positive way, not in a negative way. And uh, this has been a very, very uh, fascinating uh, discussion. And I must thank uh, each of you for firstly being here. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it was AM start for us, uh, but for our friends from the United States, it's really, really late in the night uh, or early morning, depending on how you want to look at it. But thank you very much for being here. Mr. Ranjan, uh, I know you are a very busy person, but uh, thank you for making time to join us in this fascinating discussion. Uh, Stacy and Nankam, your inputs have been extremely valuable as well. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, it's going to make for a very, very uh, useful discussion. Um, I, I will. I very much enjoyed moderating this session, and I hope that the gig economy spurs a major round of growth around the world, and maybe even spurs innovation to fight Corona. Right? Maybe you know, crisis like the pandemic needs some serious out of the box thinking. And the you know uh, cultures like or movements like the gig economy spur such levels of innovation which conventional economies sometimes cannot. So on that note, gentlemen, I would like to thank you once again for being here, and uh, thank you to the audience as well. It's been a pleasure moderating this session. Thank you, and have a thank wonderful you. day and a wonderful thank you. Conference. Mm -hmm. thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.